Today is Passion Sunday here in South Windsor, Connecticut. The Mass <coughs> Epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9. So the Hebrews are the Jews. So he's writing to the Jews. They know well the old law. They know the ceremonies. So he's talking about this, how it all points to our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, Christ being come a high priest of the good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood, entered once into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and of oxen and the ashes of a heifer being sprinkled, sanctify such as are defiled as to the cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who by the Holy Ghost offered himself immaculate unto God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And therefore he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of his death, for the redemption of those transgressions which were under the former testament, they that are called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. John chapter 8. At that time Jesus said to the multitudes of the Jews, Which of you shall convince me of sin? If I say the truth to you, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth the words of God. Therefore you hear them not, because you are not of God. The Jews therefore answered and said to him, Do not we say well, that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you have dishonored me. But I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Amen, amen, I say to you, if any man keep my word, he shall not see death forever. The Jews therefore said, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If any man keep my word, he shall not taste death forever. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead? Whom dost thou make thyself? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father that glorifies me, of whom you say that he is your God, and you have not known him, because I know him, but I know him. And if I shall say to you that I know him not, I shall be like to you a liar. But I do know him, and do keep his word. Abraham, your father, rejoiced that he might see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, Before Abraham was made, ego sum, I am. They took up stones, therefore, to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. So by way of announcement, we are coming to the two great weeks, the two greatest weeks of the whole year. This is the heart of the whole church year right now, is Passion Tide, and then the week after Holy Week. And most likely, obviously, you're not going to have the Holy Week ceremonies, but uh, God is not limited by that. He still wants to pour out His grace to you, and great graces, special graces, 
that he reserves for Holy Week. So do your best to keep the spirit of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, what she would be thinking, how she would be following our Lord, how she would be taking every step with him in that Holy Week when he goes in on Tuesday and overturns the money changers for a second time in the temple with a whip in his hand. The anger of Christ, the anger of God, when his father is insulted. And then um, our Lord goes to Bethany, and um, St. Mary Magdalene brings out the best ointment and anoints his feet. And the whole house of Bethany, which was a big house, because Lazarus was wealthy and had a lot of land, it smelled, the, the whole house smelled with this, this ointment, this nard, this perfume. And that's when Judas got all upset, remember? And Judas says, why are you wasting this money on, on Christ? You could give it to the poor. When Judas all that time was stealing from the purse and was lying and conniving. So Christ defends St. Mary Magdalene. And he says, what she does is for my burial because she won't have time to bury me in the proper way. And this is what this is. This counts for that. And then, um, and then, so so we see the hypocrisy of Judas and the twelve apostles. And so all this during Holy Week, Our Lady is very close to the Sacred Heart. And then, of course, on Good Holy Thursday, the first Mass, the institution of the priesthood, the institution of the Holy Eucharist, the Last Supper. And um, the Virgin Mary certainly was following every word, every step of her divine son. And then his going to the Garden of Gethsemane, his agony in the Garden. The Virgin Mary, his mother Mary of Agreda tells us the Virgin Mary was, she knew everything our Lord was going through. And even though she could not comprehend the depth of it all, she knew she was given by the angels to see and suffer with Christ. She suffered in her heart what Christ suffered in his body, the, the bloodshed and the, the final arrest of Christ, and then his tortures in the prison, all night long left to this pack of dogs. The Jews all night long had their hate and revenge and satanic fury unleashed on our Lord. Our Lord revealed to a poor Claire nun the 15 secret tortures that he went through in that night of between Holy Thursday and Good Friday, and how cruel they were. He, they tore out his beard, they made him stand on any incandescent metal sheet barefoot, burning red hot. And remember, those feet with the third degree burn will be walking up the rocks and dirt road to Calvary extremely, extremely painful. And then they, among the tortures, our Lord revealed um, that they dragged him around down the steps with his hands and feet tied. They stepped on him. They took sewage, raw sewage, smeared it into his face, into his mouth. Horrible. Horrible what our Lord went through, through these. And it's, of course, it's our sins also that added to this and uh, so many of many other tortures they made him sit on a, a seat with nails poking up and push him down so by morning they had to clean him up of course to bring him before Pontius Pilate and, uh, and then before Pontius Pilate cried the, the unjust condemnation of Christ by the, the liberal Democratic Republican Pilate and the filthy Herod that Christ wouldn't even look at nor, nor speak to. Because he, Christ himself said, you don't throw your pearls to swine. And then uh, Christ's condemnation to death. And he's carrying up the cross. So the Virgin Mary carried, was suffered everything with him. And she stood at the foot of the cross. She stood at the foot of the cross, hearing all the blasphemies, the insults, the mockeries of, her, of Christ the King. St. Jerome says, when the Pharisees gathered at the foot of the cross and said, well, if you, okay, here's your chance. If you're Elijah, if you're greater than Elijah, if you're really the Messiah, 
Let's see some action now. Come down from the cross. Then we'll believe you. St. Jerome says, you think they'd really believe him? After they saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, the young man from the dead, Tabitha from the dead, cured the blind man in the temple, which made the Jews furious, and uh, cured millions of people throughout all of Judea and Samaria and up to even into Lebanon. And St. Jerome says, you think they really would believe if Christ came down from the cross? They wouldn't believe. They have Moses and the prophets. Abraham told Lazarus in the parable of, of Christ, they have Moses and the prophets. And even if someone rose from the dead, they still will not believe. So St. Jerome says, Christ patiently waited. And it was a more stupendous miracle that Christ would rise out of the tomb after being buried and dying on the cross and rising three days after. That was far greater a miracle than if he came down from the cross at that time. And still they won't believe. And they have the report of the soldiers. Oh, it could be easily up to a hundred soldiers, Roman soldiers, who were put to guard the tomb. And they all witnessed the resurrection. And they told the Jews, the Pharisees and the high priest, they still refused. And even after they saw miracles done by St. Peter and Paul and all the apostles, St. John, they, they tried to put them to death. They scourged them, they imprisoned them, and they stoned St. Stephen. And they put St. Lazarus, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Martha, and two other saints on a boat to let them die out on the Mediterranean Sea. But the angels led the boat up to Marseille, southern France, and it's there that St. Mary Magdalene spread the faith, and St. Lazarus became bishop and preached the Catholic faith. And uh, he died a holy death there in southern France, and his skeleton is kept in the basilica there. And St. Mary Magdalene, she lived in a cave called Baume, B-A-U-M-E, and that's a place of pilgrimage that many people for centuries have been going to pray there where St. Mary Magdalene spent the end of her life. So, so during these next weeks, be close to the Virgin Mary, see the passion through her eyes, and meditate, contemplate this, these great realities. There was an age, you know, there was an age when kings and the whole city would basically shut down on Holy Week. All the businesses would shut down and all the attention was given to Christ. And that's why the veiling of the crucifix, the veiling of statues during these next two weeks, so that our whole heart and focus is on our Lord Jesus Christ and on his great proof of his divine love for us in his sacred passion. And I certainly encourage you, um, we all know it's not, you know, flawless, but I certainly encourage you in this, in this age of audiovisual, it certainly may help some of you to actually see the, again, the, the film, the, the Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson. Um, and like I said, I know it's not flawless, but it is quite good. Um, many priests can attest to this. When it first came out in the, what was it? In the, when did it first come out? 2004 or 5, right? 2003, 4. 2000, that time. 2003. Yeah, the, the modernist bishops were condemning it, saying that it's not historical, and the Jews never killed Christ, and they were denying the very scriptures. These, these bishops who should have been condemned and excommunicated by the, the Pope. But... Uh, we can attest as priests that when that film came out, I think it was a great grace for the whole world. Because any priest can tell you, after that movie came out, you started having penitence. Father, it's been 70 years since my last confession. I'm here because of that movie. Father, has been 50 years. It's been 20 years. It's been 10 years since my last confession. The, the, and they, I, I do believe just like in any work of art or poetry, there can be divine inspiration. You hear a piece of 
you know, classical Mew Mozart, for example, or where there's some, there's a gift of God in them. Where there's beauty and goodness, there's God, a touch of God's grace and His help. And this movie, uh, it certainly had some inspiration of the Holy Ghost, because it really portrays the Virgin Mary and her role, and that's something the Protestants never do. And Mel Gibson, being a traditional Catholic himself, he, his guide through that filmmaking was the Anne Catherine Emmerich's description of the passion, of what she saw. And for example, you'll notice in the movie, when uh, they flipped Christ over, they nailed him and they were going to flip him over to, to uh, adjust the nails on the opposite side of the cross. They were going to flip him and let him land face first into the rocks. And that's there the Virgin Mary appealed to God the Father and the angels, please don't let this happen. This just one thing of all his suffering, don't let him be smashed like that. And so the, Anne Catherine Emmerich describes the angels upholding the cross. And Christ was facing downward, but he, didn't, he wasn't in the rocks. And for example, St. Uh, Mel Gibson brings that out in the film. But all the executioners and all the Jews, they don't pick up this miracle. And just like at, at the arrest when Christ cured the ear of Malchus, right in front of the eyes of this pack of rats, he works a miracle right in front of their eyes, and they, they, their eyes are blinded. They're satanically blinded. And so um, we know that also uh, Jim Caviezel, the actor, he was 33 years old when Mel Gibson asked him. And um, Jim Caviezel himself, when he was playing the part of the scourging, um, remember in the real scourging, the shroud shows the pillar was pulled up on a pulley and Christ was actually kind of suspended with his toes dangling on the ground. The shroud shows Christ was scourged naked. Naked. Very cruel. Very vicious. And uh, the portrayal of the scourging is, is uh, very close. Very, very close to the truth. And the truth was much, much more severe. Because uh, the mystics say they could count the ribs of Christ after the scourging. And, uh, but, Mel, but Jim Caviezel, the actor, he, he says that twice, when he was chained and was being whipped with the cover on his back, accidentally, the whip hit him on the side. And it knocked him out cold. And the second time it happened by accident, his, his wrist came right through the metal rings, tore off skin off his hands, and knocked him out. He, so he was just hit twice when, when our Lord was hit so innumerable times. So that gives us an idea of what's suffering. And I mean, uh, we Americans, all of us, we really, we, we do like sports. That is, that's not a bad thing as long as we keep it in its place. But uh, if you've played sports, especially sports like hockey or football, or uh, you know the, the contact sports, it's not uncommon, it's, actually it's very common, that someone gets knocked out. Or um, I've seen games when, when uh, a guy was hit and he, he got a dislocated shoulder. It was a clean hit and he's the guy on the ice, is rolling on the ice, shouting in pain. And the medics got to come, and they stop the game, and the refs, and everybody gets on their knee, and uh, maybe some of them are praying for him, and uh, whatever it is, but he's shouting in pain from a dislocated shoulder. And we know that on the cross, the shroud shows, although no bone of his was broken, as prophesied, they would be numbered. They have numbered all my bones. And part of the numbering was the counting of his ribs, because of the exposure from the skin being torn off at the scourging, and the numbering of the dislocating of the shoulder, where they had to pull it to fit into the hole. And Mel Gibson does show this well also in his film. So the film, 
uh, say what you want. I know that, like I said, it's, it's not flawless, but it's quite well done, and um, it may be a help for, for you to really contemplate the suffering of our Lord and uh, the closeness of the Virgin Mary. So uh, I encourage you. And remember Father Somerville, he's an old priest. Uh, Father Somerville is now in an old folks' home up in uh, Quebec. Unless he died, I don't, I don't remember. Um, but anyway, he had been with the, the Messina Dominican nuns for a while as their chaplain. And Father Somerville was the priest that Mel Gibson had say mass for the cast every morning. So early in the morning, they would be all at mass, the Tridentine Mass. And Father Somerville, a good old Tridentine Mass priest, who himself at Vatican II, he was directly involved with changing the mass. And he was the one involved with putting all this goofy music in the mass and putting in these ceremonies and rites and all these Protestant things in the mass. And he repented of it because he saw the damage he had done to the most sacred thing, the sacrifice of the mass. He repented of it. And our good Father Somerville, after, in his old age, he came back to the Tridentine Mass and, 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 and uh, kept, keeps it. But at one of the Masses, at the sermon, he told the cast, here you are spending millions of dollars, tons of makeup, tons of fake blood, tons of uh, hours memorizing Hebrew and Greek, and just to portray a segment of the Passion. But Father Somerville said, but here at Mass, this gift from Christ himself, in a few moments, in the words of consecration, the very event of Calvary is not just acted, but is for real present on the altar. And that is what the Mass is. So, uh, again, I encourage you to focus on these next two weeks. Try to be less distracted and try to give more time to contemplate the sufferings of our Lord, especially the Stations of the Cross, readings of His Passion. And uh, remember, there's a great grace given in Holy Week even if you don't have the ceremonies, that won't stop our Lord from pouring out His grace. Try to read the Missal, follow with the Missal, especially the reproaches of Good Friday. These are powerful prayers. My people, what have I done to you? I led you across the Red Sea, and He led us across the Red Sea by our baptism. The Red Sea from slavery of Egypt to the devil by sin, original sin, and passing through the Red Sea of Christ's blood, through the sacrament of baptism and or confession and, and going to the other side being freed from the slavery of the devil and I have led you across the Red Sea and you have prepared a cross <clears throat> you have prepared a cross for me and I gave you water to drink from the rock and for us he gives us to drink from the rock which is Christ in the mass Every Mass we drink His precious blood, His sweet water of His grace. I have fed you with water from the rock, and you have prepared, you have scourged me. And I have, uh, I have honored you, fed you with manna in the desert, and He fed us even something far greater, His own body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Holy Eucharist. I fed you manna in the desert, and, and you crowned me with thorns. My people, what have I done to you? Why? What have I, in what way have I offended you? Answer me. So you can meditate on these great, great words of the reproaches of Good Friday, which are uh, part of the ceremony in the, in the veneration of the crucifix on Good Friday. So, um, so join with the Immaculate Heart of Mary in these, in these next two weeks. I urge you, and remember what our Lord told St. Gertrude, and many saints, how he values, how we meditate on his passion. This is something that touches his heart most. And he, he said to St. Gertrude, a tear shed over my suffering, I value as a, 
as a pearl of, of, of a great price. So we need certainly to give God the tears of our repentance. And the real tears are shown by the, the will. I don't want to offend thee anymore, O oh Lord. I've offended you enough. Um, please give me the will to hate sin and to turn from it. And you can, you can also add that was a very fine touch Mel Gibson put at the end of the, when Christ is lowered from the cross, that there's this, the scene that shows the Virgin Mary holding the bloody dead body of Christ. And the Virgin Mary is looking at the viewer. And then there's a space of about 15 seconds of, of just silence in the black picture. And it's the theaters, as you know, were just silent. Because every human heart, every human mind could not escape being touched by the passion. The passion is not just some other movie. It's not just some other actor. It's not just some other event. It's the event of events. It's the mystery of mysteries. It is the highest event of all history. Everything before prepared for the cross, everything after hinges on the cross, down to the last day of judgment. Not one soul was affected, either for good or evil, by seeing the Passion. And like I said before, and I think many priests can attest to this, it was one of the greatest graces for our age, this movie of the Passion. And of course, the Judeo-Masons in Hollywood, they do not give the credit to the movie that it actually deserved. It surpassed every other movie, Lord of the Rings, you name it, all of them were surpassed by the Passion. And it was never given a Grammy Award, never given any honors. It's, and it may, pardon this, pardon this point, but it's a fact, no money made more, no movie made more money than that. So uh, apparently Mel Gibson's working on a film of the resurrection. So pray that uh, if it does get out, that it does much good for souls. We are in the audiovisual age, and many people don't read. The computer, the audiovisual has replaced. So these things God is using to reach souls. And there was another age that was audiovisual. That was the Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages. Most people didn't, couldn't afford books. Books were on sheepskin. Nobody had a Bible. All this talk about Protestants, only the Bible can save you. Before the printing press, nobody owned the Bible. Bibles were extremely expensive. They had to be handmade on sheepskin. And the sheep had to be fed and prepared and the sheep had to be prepared in a certain way, and their skin had to be conditioned and leathered and dried. It was a lot of work. It took a lot of skill. And then you needed armies of monks to write down every single word of Scripture. And if these weren't Protestant monks. There was no such thing as a Protestant monk. They were all Catholics. So the, you can tell any Protestant, your Bible that you would... You, attribute so much to I'm glad you enjoy our book it's our Catholic book because it's the Pope who decided which books were canonical and which ones were not and you know there were other Gospels there was the Gospel of Nicodemus the Gospel of Elijah there was other other, other Gospels and those are called the Apocrypha and Pope St. Damasus and the, the good Pope's and up until the 399, 400, they decided which books were truly from the Holy Ghost, which books were not. And it was the church to decide. And who handed down the Bible and who wrote it and who wrote it on sheepskin? Catholic monks. So nobody had the Bible. In the Middle Ages, only the very, very, very rich had a Bible. And most monasteries had one. And... Um, Maybe the kings, like St. Louis the Ninth, has had four volumes of Bible, the whole Bible on sheepskin. And you can see them in the museum in Toledo, in Spain. They're unbelievable. Every single passage has a little drawing next to it. 
like a, an image and a passage, image and passage. Beautiful. And he gave it as a gift to King Alfonso, uh, one of the Alfonsos of Spain. So nobody had a Bible. So the Middle Ages, from about 500 to the 1500s, it was an audiovisual age. So where would they see the images? They would see the, the cathedrals. The cathedrals taught them the whole Old Testament, the story of Noah and the ark, Adam and Eve, and Cain and Abel, all these prefigurings of Christ. And then uh, on the higher level, they would see how it all points to Christ. And then the New Testament was also in the stained glass windows and carved in stone. And then everything in the cathedral pointed to and was built around the altar. The altar, which, which the Old Testament prefigured Christ crucified. The New Testament acted and lived it out. And the, the, the life of Christ continues on the altar, in the sacred liturgy, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So Christ was not some museum piece to be read about and sing about and sing alleluia about like Protestants do. But for the Catholic, Christ is here. He is really in the Mass. He's really born on Bethlehem. He's really transfigured on the Mount. He's really crucified on the altar. And that's the reality of the, of the sacrifice of the Mass. That's why the Mass was the central, central focus of the church and state, kings and bishops, poor and rich, noble and peasant, craftsmen are crippled, all centered around Christ. And it had to be great and tremendous, and it was the most normal thing to see the leader of the country at Mass, to see the military attending Mass, to see the mayor of the town at Mass in line for confession. This was normal. This was what, what's called the high ages of the faith. And confessions line, confession lines were long. It wasn't utopia dream world. They were sinners too. But the state never condoned sin, such as abortion, divorce, euthanasia. They knew it was a sin. That's why confessions were long. And they had big confessions and confessions for the lepers. The lepers would go to confession in the corner. And the, medie the medievals had a, a good knowledge of construction, more maybe than even our time, where the, the leper would go, for example, in that corner, confess in that corner, and the sound would carry to the other corner where the priest was, so he wouldn't catch leprosy. Here is confession, and there was a, a, a moral presence because, for example, you can't call up Father Pfeiffer and say, can I go to confession? That won't work. There has to be a moral presence. In other words, the priest must be visible, physically visible to make a valid confession. And the leper confessional, he'd go in there, and then the priest would hear him loud and clear on the wall and absolve him and, and so forth. So these great ages of the faith was an audiovisual age, and we're kind of back to that now when um, many people don't read, many youth don't read, but they know all about computers and games and audiovisual. So I think, again, it's a blessing for our age to have men who, who have the faith and who have the talent to produce audiovisual films that can actually portray the faith. And uh, granted, there are flaws, but everything of human has full of flaws. But uh, look at the good fruits it has given. And another good sign is the, how much the enemies of Christ hated the passion, and still do. How much they put a fight. Some of you who were around at the time, you remember the big war of the Judeo Masons made against Mel Gibson's movie. It was an uproar. And, in, and uh, I was a priest at Los Gatos at the time, and I had mass in Sacramento. And uh, in Sacramento, the bishop, one of the priests, the, the principals of a school, a Navasoto school, fired one of his history teachers for a, assigning the students as an assignment to watch the Passion of Mel Gibson. He was fired for promoting too much violence. 
And we have even families who won't let their children watch it because it's too violent. But yet they'll watch these rated R movies with shooting everybody and killing, and and that's too violent. And uh, no way. Remember the mother of God. She showed some fiery violence. Souls that never get out of hell. She showed three innocent shepherd children who had never dreamt of something so horrifying in their life. When they looked down on, I think it was July 13th, 1917, when the Virgin Mary showed those three children hell and they looked down, they saw what Sister Lucia describes, an ocean of lava, of fire. And she saw souls being tossed like sparks in a flame. So we know that in hell many can't move and others are tossed about. And then she describes the beasts of hell, the horrible beasts of hell, the devils that take on forms of huge centipedes, or huge half ant and half spider, half gorilla and half, half monkey, whatever, whatever. And the devils do have master because they're fallen angels. They have mastery over matter. An angel can make something appear right here by condensing gases and color right here. They have that power over material things. And God doesn't take it away. Remember, the angels in Scripture have two great powers of their intellect. One, they make music. The angels in heaven produce the music to glorify God. And what this music must sound like St. Francis de Sales was wondering what the music of heaven was like. And an angel appeared to him, struck an instrument one time. And St. Francis of Assisi was struck in ecstasy for three days from the beauty of that music. And St. Isaac Jobes, before his martyrdom, he saw a little glimpse of heaven and he heard vespers being chanted. And it gave him the thrill and the hope of heaven and to go through the suffering that he would go through. And so um, when the children saw the beasts of hell, the devils also have that power of music. And they inspire the satanic music. Much of the contemporary music today is inspired from the devil. You can basically say, and I know I'm going to hit some nerves here, and I'll make a lot of enemies by this, but who cares? Basically, from jazz to now, all the contemporary music, most of it, most of it, with some exceptions, uh, most of it is inspired from hell. Starting with jazz, and I know a priest who loves jazz, uh, but um, it's, it's the first music with discordant notes and no set notes, and it's, it's um, certainly rock and roll, hip hop, techno, and all the other names, grunge. Because when you tell the kids, don't listen to rock music, they say, well, I don't. I listen to hip hop. <laughs> so, so the whole genus of rock music, including hip hop, that is dangerous for the soul. It's poisonous to the soul. It's inspired by the devil. And they, the musicians themselves say it. And this is what led to one rock and roll musician to convert, unfortunately became Protestant, but he said, when I realized I was writing a piece of music, and I didn't even know what the words meant, but it just flowed out of me. The beat and the words just flowed out of me. And I didn't even know what the words meant. He, he got the creeps. And rock musicians such as David Bowie and Mick Jagger, they have said, we are not ourselves on stage. They are possessed. They themselves say it. And Mick Jagger, there's a song, I don't even know the name of the song, but it's a horrible song, but it's not wild and screaming. It's actually a kind of a calm song. And uh, this song was his allegiance to Lucifer. It's a song to Lucifer by Mick Jagger. And he has on his chest uh, a tattoo of the face of Satan. So this is, and Lady Goo Goo Gaga and all these modern, Jay-Z, he's a black guy that sings all these Freemasonic symboli symbolism in his music. 
Think of that, a black rap singer singing about Freemasonry. And this is where these people are inspired from. They sell their soul to the devil. Most of the time, they sell their soul to the devil for fame and for a few years of glory. And that's even said about Queen Elizabeth of, uh, of England, Elizabeth I. She sold her soul to the devil for a 40-year reign. She had it. But when she was dying, she didn't even want to go lay down in bed. All she saw was flames. Until the doctor ordered her, you have to lay down. You've been standing up for three days. And she would walk in circles, scared to lay down. Because she saw the flames of hell already. Because she uh, martyred so many, many, many priests. And she died a terrible death. So the angels have power over music. So beware of the music you listen to. Beware of the music your children listen to. And there is good music. But, uh, and I'm not, saying, I'm not saying you have to only listen to Gregorian chant. There's plenty of good folk music, plenty of good, healthy, good, uplifting music that's not inspired by the devil. So um, anyway... So much for the announcement. I'm not even going to give a sermon because this was long as it was. But uh, suffice it to say, in this battle that we're in, um, we are repeating. We are repeating now Good Friday. We are living Good Friday right now, when our Lord Jesus Christ is crucified again by His Pope who denies Him. These last five popes, the Vatican II, deny Him, uncrown Him, spit on Him crucify him. All the bishops have abandoned him, including the four bishops consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre. They have all abandoned their post, their position. Bishop Follet is, is, is on the verge of being recognized and receiving the personal prelature. They're all excited about it. They think it's a great breakthrough, and it's going to... But the price was 30 pieces of silver, the doctrinal declaration to betray our Lord, to crucify him. So I beg you, pray for the four bishops. Pray for Bishop Williamson, too. Um, he's sometimes, in some ways, saying, saying much worse than Bishop Follet about attending a Trinitine Mass, the least contaminated one you can find. Would Archbishop Lefebvre ever say that? Would he ever say that you can go to a Trinitine Mass of the Phineites, a Trinitine Mass of the Sedevicanus, a Trinitine Mass of the Indult, and the, the, and St. Peter's, who compromised with Vatican II in the New Mass? No, because what mattered for Archbishop Lefebvre and for any sane Catholic is the faith that matters. The faith to believe all that Christ taught. That's what matters. We can't save our soul unless our intellect believes all that God has revealed. And, and the heart of this belief is that Christ is truly God, that he really died for us, that he really rose from the dead. And that anyone who tries to dissolve Jesus Christ as God is of the Antichrist. And Vatican II and the New Mass directly attack the divinity of Jesus Christ, his kingship, his priesthood, his royalty, his only unique role as the only Savior. And that's why Vatican II is so deadly, so poisonous. That's why it attacks and dissolves our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Archbishop Lefebvre said very simply, it is of the spirit of the Antichrist. And he called the modernists in Rome <clears throat> the agents of the Antichrist. Archbishop Lefebvre, he didn't mince words. And it, but at least he spoke clearly. And he worried about the flock. He worried about all the souls all over the world who were being misled by Vatican II. <clears throat> and so as a good shepherd, he went out all over the world to, to ordain priests, to give confirmation, to preach the faith, to confirm, to baptize, to teach. If only we had bishops doing this now. But now, they're, now even his four bishops are, are betraying him. So um, pray for them and pray for, pray for, um, pray for, <laughs> what a mess. Pray for the Pope to consecrate Russia. But Pope, Pope Francis, he, he despises Fatima. He despises the rosary. He even mocks it. So what a mess we're in, right? What a mess we are really in. So persevere, little flock, but don't be deceived by, by false delusions. There is what's called the fake resistance, and it is fake. 
It is fake. Why can't they just speak clearly? Why can't they just preach clearly the way Archbishop Lefebvre did? But they speak now muddled and confused. New Mass is not so bad, it gives grace. Uh, the recognition from Rome, we, we won't change, we'll stay as we are, when they've already changed. And now you've got Society of St. Priests, St. Pius X, the new one, defending Amoris Laetitiae, this horrible document of Pope Francis that desecrates the sacredness of marriage. And then you got uh, one of the bishops condoning these horrible documents of the American bishops in Maryland and in the National Conference of Bishops that actually permit murder when there's a patient dying. They are now saying you can withhold water and food, even intravenously. And that's murder, folks. Don't fall for this. It's murder. And how could Bishop Tissier condone such a document? And if you got an elderly person dying, you and I have no right to stop feeding them water and uh, food, even by tubes. IVs are not extraordinary means now. You have to feed them. But their false compassion says, oh, but they're going to just prolong life and suffer more. But in God's eyes, that prolonged suffering might be sparing them several hundred years in purgatory. There's a wisdom why God permits suffering at the end. It's out of his mercy. It's out of his goodness. And such a soul may save their soul through that suffering. And that finally, a, a stubborn old man who's proud, and there are many of them, a uh, stubborn man proud who rejects God all his life, and we've seen this happen as priests, when they start suffering, and when they cannot even wipe themselves, and they can't even feed themselves, they start realizing, I am nothing. My God, you won. You won the wrestling match. I fought you all my life. I didn't want to obey you all my life. But now in those last moments, when they're reduced to the helplessness of a little baby, that suffering opens their heart and they convert. But when they're drugged with morphine and they can't think, and they refrain from water and food, and they're shriveling, sh shriveling up like a raisin, and they're so out of it they can't turn to God. It's very cruel. It's called compassion and comfort care. But it's the most cruel and bloody thing. And those patients who survive this, and come out of a coma, for example, and survive it, they say it was the worst suffering they ever went through. They could hear the nurses and doctors talking, don't feed them, shut the tubes off. And they're dying of thirst for just one drop. They're hungry, they're starving. And uh, it's, it's a wonder they pull through. So I recommend uh, Dr. Paul Byrne. He's, he's an 80-year-old medical doctor who's been fighting this his whole life. And he, he's written several books. He's, he's clashed with cardinals. He's clashed with bishops over this question. And, and, and over organ transplantation. I won't go into that. But all this, of course, means a lot of money for the hospitals and for those powers that be. That's why the bishops are silent about it. That's why the priests and the pope should be condemning this. But it's, it's, it's lawful. It's legalized murder. So this is our horrible Good Friday we're living in. So where do we go on this Good Friday? Where's the only place to go for refuge? To, to, to seek shelter from this horrible storm, it's the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Go to the Heart of Mary. Love the Heart of Mary. You are, you are her little ones that she loves, and she wants to gather, like Christ said, a mother hen under her wings. Gather under her mantle. This is the time of war. This is the time of battle. This is the time when we have to rise up and fight for the faith and not compromise and not fall for fake resistance and fake compromise. We can't. We have no time. We have only this life to gain heaven. So gather under the Virgin Mary, and uh, let's go now to Calvary and beg her the grace to hold the line, like Archbishop Lefebvre. Just hold the faith and strive to keep striving every day to become saints, to pull out the, the, 
weeds of sin, to really grow in the love of God, to really unite with the heart of Jesus and Mary in this time, these sacred two weeks. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.